Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, New Live Monitoring Tools for Gas Detection, sponsored by Industrial Scientific. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I will moderate today's session. Thank you all for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I want to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Josh Futrell, Senior Product Manager for Instrumentation at Industrial Scientific. Josh has worked with the company since 2011 and in his current role since October 2012. One of his responsibilities is the supervision of the product life cycle, including the RADIUS BZ1 Area Monitor released in September 2016. His areas of expertise include collecting and analyzing voice of the customer, working with development teams to formulate innovative approaches to solving problems, and rolling out new products. Josh, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Alan, for that warm introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, spending time with me this, uh, this day, and uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I hope uh, this session is going to be valuable for you. Uh, first thing, I, I want to make uh, what the topics that we're going to cover kind of clear to everyone. Um, we're going to talk about live monitoring at a broad level. Uh, at a high level in terms of what it is, what problems it solves. But we are going to be focusing on gas detection and gas detection applications, particularly portable gas detection applications. Uh, so if that, that is not of interest of you, then, then, then I might be able to save you some time on the call, um, uh, and you, can, you, can, you can, can disconnect now if you'd like to. But we're going to be talking about gas detection, live monitoring in particular. Um, we're going to talk about ways that uh, the industry right now, ourselves included, uh, and other companies are trying to give customers paths to live monitoring. We'll talk about some of the common features that you'll find in live monitoring software and the benefits that those give you. And then I'll wrap it up sort of noting some things to consider if you are looking to move uh, into live monitoring and actually you know, start using a service like this, um, or uh, if you're thinking about changing, changing service. So always, I always like to start a presentation uh, with a reminder of who Industrial Scientific is. So Industrial Scientific, um, our vision, everything that we do, every day that we come to work, we are thinking about how to send people home safely from their, their workplaces. Uh, we, are, we are dedicating our careers to ending death on the job by 2050. And uh, it is, it's a great privilege to, to be part of the teams that do that. And the way that we do that in terms of our, our mission, you know, we do that through a heart of service. Uh, our company is about best customer service every time. Um, and then the other aspect of, that's important to note about our company is uh, we've been talking about this for the last year or so, maybe two years, uh, about asking our customers if they're, are you ready for the moment, right? Gas detection equipment, 99.999% of the time doesn't really do anything for you. Uh, it, it's something that you have to have. It can even be burdensome at times. But there's that 0.001% of the time where it is the most important piece of equipment that you own. And we've been aligning everything about our product development processes and what our services 
to try to make sure that when workers encounter that moment, they have a working gas detector, uh, they know exactly how to respond and, and can help uh, get other people to, to know about the trouble that they're in in that moment instantly. So these are some questions that we've uh, asked our customers over the years. Uh, and they're rhetorical, so I don't need answers tapped into, uh, typed into the chat. But um, common questions to think about. How do you know where your workers are at any moment of the day? Do you have some kind of process in place or some kind of tool in place already to know where they are or, or not? Um, how do you know that they're safe? Uh, how much time and money and effort would it take to find out or does it take to find out? Uh, if you have a process in place, does it distract your workers? Uh, does it, does it uh, make them less productive and maybe even less, less safe? And what would happen if there was an incident, if one of your workers got into some kind of, kind of issue or hazard or had a health issue? How would you find out? Uh, how long would it take you to find out? Uh, what would the impact be to the worker during that time? Or what could the impact be? And then by extension, what would the impact be for your company? And then for you personally, if you're, you're in charge of, of safety. And then even if you have a process or tool that helps you know all these things or, or you know, know where people are and if they're safe, is it foolproof? What happens if you miss a step? What happens if a worker misses a step? What happens if an alarm is, is missed or a false alarm initiated? So these are the questions that we've asked and why we've, we and many others in the industry are building tools for live monitoring, tools that help you know who is where, when, and, and what hazards they're encountering, being able to pass gas-related information, gas hazard information, and other hazards, panic, uh, panic alarms or out-of-motion alarms or man-down alarms, and being able to access that information on control panels, on laptops, on mobile devices, either locally or from anywhere in the world, all to the, the, the end of letting people react to situations in, in real time. So why use it? Well, part of why use something that, that helps you do live monitoring automatically? Well, the first uh, answer is because it can, without it, without some kind of solution, it can take hours or days to learn about an incident. Uh, and the closer that you can uh, be to that moment that I talked about earlier, the greater the safety outcomes are, the greater the, the, the chance of actually being able to uh, extricate somebody from a hazardous situation and, and do it safely. Another reason to use it is you, you don't know where people are, right? You don't know where, if they're safe, where they're located, and that lack of situational awareness, not knowing where people are and if they're safe and even what jobs they're doing, that can not only lead to safety concerns uh, and, uh, and, and that we've talked about already, but also productivity concerns. Uh, not being able to kind of optimize your, your, you know, wh what people are working on and where uh, at any given time. And mobile workers are particularly vulnerable. So these are folks that work outside of a core industrial team or, or, or outside of a facility or a plant. These are folks that, that are uh, driving around. Uh, you might hear, hear them called uh, lone workers or think about them as lone workers. Uh, they could also be uh, mobile work crews. Think about utilities crews that, that go around uh, and, and do inspections or, or do work around cities or even uh, suburban areas or, uh, and even rural areas. Or uh, midstream, uh, oil and gas, people inspecting pipelines, et cetera. Uh, and we were really fascinated as a company about how you help mobile uh, workers in particular. Uh, because they are, you know, especially those that, that work alone, how do, you, how do you keep track of them? And so we had put out a survey as a company to, to assess what our customers were doing in terms of protecting their mobile workforce. So I'd like to run that same kind of poll with you today to see if the results are, are similar. So take a moment and, and answer this question. Does your company currently use any software or service that helps you automatically track and manage the safety of your mobile workers? So if you've 
if you've got mobile workers, are you doing anything to automate the tracking of them, either through a software or service? So the answer is either yes, no, but we do something manually. We do manual call-ins or check-ins or something of that sort. No, we don't really track our mobile workers at all. Or if you don't have mobile workers in your, your line of work, just indicate that by selecting NA below. So we'll uh, take just a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, and let everybody um, answer that. All right. About halfway there. This is interesting. All right. I'm going to give it uh, just a second or two more and then cut us off and push us to the next slide, the results slide. All right. This is, this is interesting. So only less than 10% of responders on this call are doing something to track their mobile workers. A good chunk have a manual process in place, which is good. You've at least recognized the value of knowing where people are and keeping track of them, um, uh, but, but you're maybe doing some painful steps or distracting steps to do that. And then there's a huge chunk that, that doesn't currently track their mobile workers at all. And then a good, a good amount that, that don't, do, uh, don't have mobile workers. This is Similar, maybe a little bit more skewed towards not having a solution than what we heard from, from our customer survey. So what we heard when we surveyed our customers, what, you know, do you have a solution in place to track? And this, this pie chart is, is just those worker, uh, just those customers that had um, mobile workers. So they, they, they have a mobile workforce. Do they ha do something to track them? Uh, over a third don't do anything. Um, about a quarter of them were relying on, on manual processes. And then a, a little over a third had some kind of software and serv uh, service to help track their workers. So that might just be the, the, the customer, you know, the, people, the particular people that responded to that survey were a little bit different than the group we have on the phone. But the t big takeaway that we had was there's a lot of people in our industry that have mobile workers, and a lot of those workers who have gas detection needs too, that aren't doing anything or they're living with a manual process in order to, to keep track of, of their people. And there's some challenges with, with doing nothing and with doing manual processes. So not doing anything, right? When you, you haven't done anything to track your mobile workers, um, there's nobody around to hear or see an alarm. Right, other than the worker or the workers themselves. Uh, they, it's up to them to get themselves out of, of trouble, uh, which with gas hazards, perhaps that's, that's possible uh, some of the time, if not most of the time. But there's also no coverage for man down events. Right? What happens if that person falls or has, uh, you know, their head uh, gets hit or they have a heart attack or some kind of health issue? Um, at that point, they're not able to help themselves. And so we heard, you know, we see stories like this a lot in our industry. This is a, a worker that was on the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, and around this time last year and unfortunately uh, passed away. He was working alone, and it took an incredibly long time for them to find out that he had had an accident. Um, I think it, in this case, I can't remember all the details, but I think it was even his wife noticed eventually that he was, was missing and had people investigate. So unfortunately, you know, doing nothing can lead to these kind of outcomes uh, where, where somebody gets injured or somebody gets hurt and we have ample time perhaps even to initiate an emergency response, but nobody knows. A lot of folks will do manual processes, call-ins, check-ins, what have you. Challenges with that is it's extra work. Right, it's something that the worker has to do, has to remember to do. It pulls them away from their, their core job. There are systems that kind of help automate it a bit, uh, but it's still something extra that they've got to pay attention to. And 
if people aren't paying attention, then a lot of things can go wrong with manual processes. Either a worker, you know, not following process on their side and an emergency response gets initiated in terms of a, a false alarm. Um, or uh, on the other side, if the supervisor or the person who's supposed to monitor the check-ins misses one, uh, then it, you know, you could have somebody who in that time frame had an incident and, and their, their absence went unnoticed. And at the end of the day, the manual processes aren't really timely. A lot of people will do check-ins every hour. At the, at, that's probably the highest frequency I've ever heard. Uh, but often it's every two hours or every four hours or just tell me when you start your day and tell me when you end your day. Uh, and unfortunately, the more, if you're using a manual process, the more timely you want to be. Like if you wanted to know how somebody was doing every minute, that's a lot of extra work. That first bullet becomes a lot more arduous. Um, and so that's why, you know, it might take you an hour, even in best case, I think, with manual processes to know if somebody's in a hazard. That leads to situations like, like the story that I, we heard during um, the project that we had to, to launch our new uh, INET Now service. Um, this is, uh, we heard a story about a worker who hung by his leg uh, for hours until his, his missed check-in was noticed. So he, was, he ended up being okay, thank goodness. He, 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 was, he was rescued. His leg was worse for wear, but he, was, he, he went home to his family at the end of the day. And thank goodness he had that, the, you know, the check-in process at least, but it still took hours uh, for him to be uh, identified as being at risk and for an, uh, an emergency response to be uh, initiated. And I would not want to be that worker in that situation for those many hours. Another way that people solve, uh, you know, try to help protect their, their, their mobile workers or workers is, is a buddy system. Let's, uh, instead of you going out and working alone, let's send a group out or have a group of guys go out and, and watch each other's back, which is, is, adds a lot of, adds a safety factor for sure, but it is inefficient in the sense that if you do have a task that could be done by one person, now you've got multiple people there. You've got a plan to have two people there. Um, and at, at, in the, those buddies might not always be available. You might have after hours calls, a buddy might get sick, et cetera. It's not, it's not foolproof in and of itself. And at the end of the day, the hazards could end up impacting both workers. Uh, we've heard many stories like this one uh, that, that happened um, fairly recently, earlier this year, um, about utility workers, you know, one by one, trying to rescue each other from a hazard, uh, one by one, unfortunately, went into the, the same hazard and passed away. And um, this, this particular scenario is one of the reasons that Industrial Scientific rolled out uh, lens wireless technology a little while ago, uh, this time last year, uh, to allow workers to connect to each other. Right, so these buddies, at least if they're watching each other's back, can have information shared between their gas detectors. Um, but it would have been, how much better would that have been, or this situation would have been with that feature. Uh, but if that information had also been passed on to a supervisor who maybe could have called immediately and intervened in the rescue attempts or coached them through the rescue attempts, uh, could the outcome have been different if that team had been provided some form of live monitoring service? And I think the answer is yes, and I hope it is. Uh, we, we have situations in the future where this kind of incident is avoided with the use of live monitoring systems. So why, you know, we, we talk about live monitoring um, as if it's a relatively new thing, and it, it, it is and it isn't in gas detection. So for many, many years, for decades, gas detectors just alerted each other uh, just alerted the local user. Um, one, you know, the instrument would go into alarm. It was basically a canary on steroids or, you know, electronic canary, so to speak. Um, the next step in gas detection occurred maybe a decade ago where we got, as an industry, we got really good at sharing data locally, right? Having data go from a gas detector back to a local system like a laptop or, or a local server. It's really recently that we've kind of hit two other kind of key elements to live monitoring. One is being able to share live data between peers, as I talked about with Lens Wireless, and then now also being able to get that real-time data, not just locally, but remotely, sending it up to the cloud 
um, and and out so that it can be accessed anywhere in the world and do all kinds of wonderful things in terms of notifications uh, and keeping keeping people connected. The the big issue right now is the existing you know because this is still relatively new for for even industrial scientific and our you know most of our competitors we're still starting to build momentum in that new era in terms of getting things to the cloud and getting people connected. There's some challenges that we're all working to overcome. Uh, one of the challenges is, and, and we took this very seriously when we, we thought about our product, was how complicated it is to set up and to use, how complicated it is to purchase, how complicated it is to install, how you have to have a lot of infrastructure often in place and put out a lot of money in training and write a lot of SOPs in, in terms of getting people up to speed on, on the technology. We knew that we, we needed to do something to, to make it easier for people uh, and we're all, I think, in the industry working towards that. Another key challenge uh, is reliability of communication. Uh, how do you make sure that, that if you're going to the cloud, everything is robust and, 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 and works and fails over and you have, have a good path to the cloud and to those who can help you? Another particular challenge uh, is, is making gas detectors fit for use while introducing some new technology that facilitates these features, particularly in hazardous locations. It's always more challenging to make a device that's going to go into an explosive environment than it is in our homes. And so what that means is often we're trying to make, uh, we're not necessarily using the latest technology or making compromises in order to use technology inside of a personal portable um, hazardous locations ready gas detector. Another challenge that we've heard uh, time and again is uh, a big brother concerns. Uh, are we concerned about, uh, you know, unions, for example, might be concerned about implementing a live software, a live monitoring software solution because it's big brother watching me making sure I'm doing my job. Um, we have found that when the focus is on safety rather than productivity, that, that concern can be alleviated. I think we even wrote a, a blog post recently about this very, very issue uh, in terms of, of helping coaching people through that big brother concern. Another big challenging thing that I think, you know, if you're, you're sitting there, you're an end user, you're a customer, you're somebody who's thinking about live monitoring solutions is there's a lot of different options out there right now. Um, we asked in that same survey, survey that I talked about earlier, what software and service are you using in order to do your, your live monitoring? And the answers were all over the place. We, there's, we go from options A through V in terms of uh, options that people could choose from. And then uh, we had uh, a lot of people who selected other. We're, doing, we're using some other software or service to, to monitor our people. Now, not all of these had gas detection as part of the, the solution, only a handful of them did. Uh, but there are a lot of ways that you can start to track your workers um, uh, and, and live monitor them that, that don't include gas detection. But how do you choose, right? How do you make sure that you've got the right, right solution for you? So the first thing to think about, I think, is, is uh, and I, I'm kind of a nerdy engineering type, I think about what's, what system is going to get me there. What's the kind of building blocks that I need in order to get the end result? And there's a couple of different paths right now or building blocks that can be assembled to facilitate live monitoring and gas detection equipment. So the first is um, a radio. So putting some kind of radio inside of an instrument or a device uh, that radio typically is either 900 megahertz or some flavor of it, or 2.4 gigahertz. Um, the protocols could either be point-to-point, -point, where the instrument talks only to one thing if it's point-to-point, -point, or mesh, where all the instruments work together to share information. And that radio in the instrument would talk to a gateway, some box, and there's a lot of different flavors of boxes that would receive that information and then send it either to a local system or laptop or computer, or it would send it directly to the cloud through cell or Wi-Fi or satellite or Ethernet or, or a couple of, you know, other communication protocols. Um, this has been around, I think, for, this is the, the infrastructure that's been around for a decade. I think the cloud part is relatively recent. 
uh, a new addition to, to this, this solution. It's mainly been local for a long time, but this, this kind of approach has been around for, for a while, which is a good thing. Um, it's, it's, it's robust and there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of good things about it in terms of getting good range between the instrument and the gateway, the options that you have available to you in terms of those gateways, uh, and the communication, communication channels available. The biggest con is that it requires infrastructure, right? And, and maybe perhaps a lot of it, depending on your application, right? It requires a gateway in every vehicle or it requires a, a, a gateway in every vehicle and gateways at the different sites that those mobile workers are going to. Um, it, it, it also, depending on the technology that you're choosing, um, could be uh, hard to install. Uh, you also might have hard time getting service because sometimes the gateway providers are different than, than the instrument manufacturers. And then depending on the radio um, and, and, uh, and the technology that's used for that, you might not have a lot of options in terms of getting back to that gateway. So if you have a point-to-point -point radio, if that instrument doesn't have direct line of sight to that gateway, then uh, you don't have communications, whereas a mesh network can, can be used to kind of help uh, uh, have multiple paths back to a gateway. Very dense slide. If you've got questions, we can always come back to, uh, to these slides uh, at the end, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, go ahead and type them into the, um, into the, the, the lower left-hand uh, chat box. Another path to live monitoring is with Wi-Fi, so putting Wi-Fi inside of an instrument and then having that Wi-Fi talk to an access point. Uh, and then that access point basically does the same thing that um, the gateway in the prior slide would do. So really the only thing that's changed here is now the instrument, instead of talking with the radio, is talking with Wi-Fi. Um, this is, um, we've got similar cons to the prior slide in terms of it requires an, uh, a lot of infrastructure and with Wi-Fi, given its range, it, it needs even more than, than some of the, the, the solutions on the prior slide. Uh, you also are likely going to need help from your IT department and your IT group in order to get this going uh, and, and um, set up and, and maintained. Um, the other uh, con of this is it's, it's, there aren't many solutions currently on the market that allow you to do this and get to the cloud effectively. A lot of these right now, at least, and I know this will change in the near future, but a lot of them are designed to be kind of local only, right? I, I go to my local Wi-Fi network, and then I'm on a computer in that network, and I'm able to, to see the data and respond, but the data doesn't get to the cloud easily for a lot of solutions. What's good about these kind of approaches is that infrastructure can be used for many other things, right? If you've got Wi-Fi in a, in a plant or a facility, now that Wi-Fi can be used for other applications in addition to safety, can be used for operations and that kind of thing. Uh, the reason this bullet is in blue is because Industrial Scientific offers, offers this currently. We have our Accenture Life Safety Solution with our Ventus LS that we offer that, that provides this, this path to live monitoring, at least at the local level. Another path to live monitoring is with Bluetooth. So Bluetooth has uh, come of age uh, to the point where it is efficient enough in terms of power consumption and use to put inside of something like uh, a gas detector. So uh, our Ventus Pro and, and many of our, our competitors' instruments now have a Bluetooth option, specifically BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. And another path to live monitoring with Bluetooth is having that communicate to a smart device. Um, most typically a, a smartphone, an Android or iOS device. And then that smart device can communicate that information directly to the cloud uh, uh, through cell or through uh, Wi-Fi. Um, what's great about this is it's, it's easier. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. We've cut out some pieces. Um, you're reusing equipment that often is on site anyway. A lot of people are carrying their phones, uh, particularly mobile workers. Um, and, and you have to make a limited investment in terms of infrastructure because of that. The cons are, right now, Bluetooth, the range isn't very, very uh, uh, long, about less than 100 feet or 30 meters. Um, 
And there's not many intrinsically safe smart devices out there that, that can, can effectively work with the gas detectors on the market currently. Uh, there are some, uh, and I think more will develop over the next several years. Uh, but for now, um, there's not a lot of intrinsically safe smart device options. There are cases that you can put on smart devices to help make them ready for Division 2 or Zone 2. Um, many customers that, that I've talked to have started to make um, – I don't have an opinion of this approach, but they, they've started to make the decision to allow their workers to carry smart devices, non-intrinsically safe smart devices, into hazardous locations if they've got a multi-gas um, uh, instrument with them detecting explosive gases. They've made a, a risk-benefit decision that the risk of keeping that worker connected and having access to something like a smart device is, is worth the added risk that its presence brings, um, though that's mitigated by the multi-gas uh, detector. Again, this is highlighted in blue because this is, this is something that Industrial Scientific offers. We just rolled this out yesterday uh, with our, our INET Now uh, software uh, live monitoring system. Finally, another path to live monitoring is, and this is one of the most simple of all, is to just put cell inside of the instrument. Uh, we don't currently have this. There are those on the market that do. Uh, what's great about this is it's one less piece of equipment. Right? You don't have to have your workers carrying cell phones. Uh, it's rated and ready to go for hazardous locations. The biggest con of this approach, uh, which I think all everybody in the industry is looking at and, and thinking about how to overcome, is one because you're you know because of the restrictions in gas detection in terms of power consumption and, and the hazardous locations, you're not using necessarily the latest and greatest technology. So the cellular technology that's available to put inside of gas detection equipment is not, you know, 4G, 5G. It's, it's prior to that. It's, it's older than that. Uh, and so you can sometimes end up with not the best, you know, you, you don't have the best of both worlds, right? You, you're getting a gas detector and making some compromises on that side. You're getting cell, but you're making compromises on that side, and you end up with something that's more of a spork. Uh, than something that, uh, that, that is really built for daily, you know, rugged use for, for all applications. Um, and you also might be limited in terms of, of, you know, what carriers or what cell options you have uh, to use with that. But it is elegant. It just, it's, the instrument talks directly to the cloud. And when it's able to do that, it, it works like gangbusters. But again, what if you've got a confined space team Right, that, that needs to go into a place where they're you know, underground, where they don't have cell connectivity, then all of a sudden they are out of touch and there isn't a way to get back uh, into touch with this solution. So some good things about it, some cons about it. So those are the four main paths to get that, that we've seen to get an instrument talking to the cloud. So now let's talk about what happens once you're there, once you're in the cloud. So cloud-based live monitoring software, and these are, these, this is a, a picture there of, of our INET Now solution, um, but typically what you're going to get is you're going to get the ability to see the worker status and location in real time from anywhere in the world. You'll be able to customize uh, alerts, so you, you can have a, an exception-based system where Based on different conditions, you'll be able to get texts or emails. Uh, and then you'll be able to respond immediately when somebody encounters a hazard rather than waiting on uh, uh, them to self-report it or for the instrument to be docked days, weeks, months, or never later. Also, having cloud-based software versus local software affords you a system that's a lot easier to manage and configure and set up and grow and scale. And, and change over time. Typically what you'll see, uh, or you can you enable other people to see, is a live map. All right, so this is an example of a live uh, map of, of workers around, in this case, the, the globe, working in different parts of the world. Um, and we can see we've got, you know, we've got somebody in trouble there at the top in red, uh, a gas alarms occurring. We can drill in and get more details about them. 
get access to their phone number and call them. Uh, everybody in green is good, and, and those that are in yellow or, or gray have either stopped communicating or are powered off. Uh, but again, at a quick glance, you can see where people are and how they're doing and have your attention drawn to those most critical uh, issues uh, that, you, that you need to address and respond to. I mentioned that uh, real-time alerts, these are examples of, of an email on the left and a text message on the right of alerts that can be generated with live monitoring systems. So again, you can get a text on your phone um, that Mike O'Brien, for example, is in, in a high alarm. In this case, he's got H2S uh, spiking, and, and you can tell exactly uh, where he is. Uh, and you can always you know, drill in and get more information on the, on the live website as well. But it's a, a great tool in terms of you can watch dots on a map and people move around if you want to, but uh, you can also have texts and emails grab your attention uh, when an exception uh, occurs. And that can be configured um, based on, on your rules and your policies and your processes. Uh, so it, it, with INET now, you can, you can um, decide who gets notified about what event and, and when, right? So you can, they can either get notified by text or email. They can care about everything. They can care about just uh, panic alarms or even customized alarm levels or, or gas levels. Uh, and you can have many, many different alerts going to many, many different people about the same person if you wanted to, or the same piece of equipment or the same groups of equipment. So again, that high configurability that you get in those, those online cloud systems allows you to kind of manage things in real time so that you can manage by exception rather than having to, to constantly watch, watch a, a map. And then another great tool is, is when an event, after an event has occurred or an alert has occurred, you should be able to review that event, where it happened, who, ha who it happened to, when did it start, when did it end, who got notified about it. Uh, you should be able to add you know, notes and, and, and document um, if it was safe or not. Um, and retrieve that at any time, right? So that you can you can kind of always reflect on on where the hazards occur now occurred. Now, of course, you know if you're tracking your your uh, systems data log, uh, you know your instruments uh, data logs, then that's another way to get at this information. But in this case, you could get it days or weeks or months ahead of time. So um, if you're thinking about getting a live monitoring system, some kind of live monitoring software solution. There's a couple of things that I think you should think about, whether you're looking at our, our solutions or anybody's. First and foremost, if, if you're somebody that cares about gas detection, your first question should be, what applications do I have for gas detection? And does this solution help me uh, meet those applications? So how would this solution work if I need to do, if my team needed to do a confined space or my people needed to do a confined space and they needed some kind of pump or aspirated unit to do sampling? What happens when people go into that confined space? Uh, what about area monitoring, right? If I wanted to have, have people use area monitors as well, does that work uh, in, in the solution? And then are you confident that the gas detectors are fit for use in your application? Right? I think you know, it's great that we've got good software, it's great that we've got gateway options, but at the, at the end of the day, the gas detector is still one of the most important pieces of safety equipment that you can give your people, and you wanna make sure that that's fit for you. So take a hard look at it, uh, particularly at the sensors. Uh, what, what, what sensors are available to me? Are, are they, those gonna cover my major risks? Do the sensors measure the ranges that I, that I, I, I want to measure? Do they go high enough? Um, what sensor types are they uh, in terms of, you know, if, if I've got to measure explosive gases, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather have, you know, in some applications, most applications, you'd rather have a catalytic bead um, LEL sensor uh, to measure explosive gases because there's other technologies that are blind to gases like hydrogen or acetylene. So take a hard look at the sensors and, and at the instrument uh, in particular and, and assess its strengths and weaknesses first and its it fit for use, uh, fitness for use first. Then you can move on to the other questions, which is 
Are we going to have the connectivity options that we need? Thinking about all those different gateway options, you know, the, the, it was very general in those slides, but there's many, many different flavors of gateways and ways to get to the cloud. Am I actually going to be able to do that um, and do that that reliably, right? I, I We've talked to people who, um, for example, are thinking of cellular. Uh, one of the nice things about smartphones is you can, you can actually, the smartphones are built for that. They're built for connectivity. And you can get a smartphone with a carrier uh, that's hyper-local. I know down in West Virginia, my, my, where my parents live, they, they don't have one of the national brand carriers. They use a, a local carrier because they get much better service. And so, uh, you know, and then on one side of the mountain, AT&T works really well. And on the other side of the mountain, Verizon works really well. So think about your connectivity options um, and, and you know, make sure that you're going to have the right connectivity. Um, do, you, do you have access to the right smart device OSs? So if you uh, want to equip people with a solution that uses a smart device, um, do you have Android and iOS options available to you? If you're using Wi-Fi, does the Wi-Fi security have the right options, et cetera? And then another question to ask is, are the right people going to get the right information at the right time? Um, so, you know, there are some solutions out there that offer third-party monitoring services, folks that will watch the dots on the map for you and then initiate responses for you, and that, that can be good. Um, but perhaps you and your, your situation have people that might even be better equipped to respond and to handle those calls rather than relying on a third party. Um, and, and if you can give them access to the same dashboard, would that, would that be sufficient and maybe even better? Or rather than having those people watch a map all the time, what about, you know, them getting real-time alerts uh, so that they don't have to? Um, so are you going to be able to get the right information to the right people at the right time? And then finally, last two questions are, does the solution – Add to, enhance, or detract from my gas detection program? Am I, am I going to be able to, does it help me manage my overall gas detection program? Because at the end of the day, if a gas detector isn't ready for use, if it's not calibrated and properly maintained, uh, it, it's not doing its primary, primary function. So is the solution that, that I have available or that I'm considering going to help me uh, manage my gas detection program as well? And then finally, how, what kind of support am I going to get? Once everything's in place and like I start to use it and I have problems, how's that technical support going to be? How are my lead times going to be when I need new equipment or I have service issues? Uh, if I have, you know, a, a, a spike need, like I need to rent equipment uh, or I need to add a lot of equipment rapidly, will, I, will the manufacturer actually be able to help me, me with that? So again, many things to think about as you look at at live monitoring uh, solutions out there. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, before we open it up to questions, a uh, couple of final thoughts. So technology is evolving quite rapidly. Uh, we remember, remember back to that prior slide where we have era one, two, three, and four. We talked about how era three and four are relatively recent, just within the last uh, few years. Um, the technology to enable cloud connectivity in hazardous locations is, is growing. Uh, the options available to industrial scientific and other uh, manufacturers of these products are growing. And I think we're going to see in the next five years a lot of innovation in this area uh, that will help the ease, you know, increase the ease of use and, and increase the reliability and the, you know, those challenges that we talked about in a prior slide will continue to go down and go away. Um, but the technology right now with, that, that we have is viable and provides a lot of value and is better than doing nothing. So if you're in that category, if you answered, you know, we're not doing anything or we're doing something manual, now's the time to start looking, uh, to start looking at the many different paths available to you. Uh, it's the time to start trialing equipment and testing equipment. And then just, again, one last plug, never compromise on, on gas detection, right? Never, never give your folks a subpar or make compromises on the gas detector uh, in exchange for this, this service. Um, 
So with that, I'll conclude and open it up to questions. But before I do, um, just a plug, if, if you'd like to see a demonstration of, of INET now or ask questions about what I've covered in person, uh, we'll be at uh, NSC in Indianapolis next week at booth 1612. You can learn, learn more information on our website, or you can contact me uh, at, at jfutrell at indsci.com, where you can call me, and that's my, my cell phone number. So use it prudently, but, but if you've got questions, you've got concerns, you have ideas, uh, any feedback for me, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. Great work, Josh. Thank you for your excellent insights and expertise. Uh, before we start the q and I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. Uh, the survey should be appearing on your screen. Your input is important because it will help us uh, improve future webcasts. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Now let's get to some questions. Could you use a combination of paths to get data to the cloud, or is it always one or the other? That's a good question. Um, the answer is yes. There are some systems out there that can let you do uh, multiple paths. So some, like for example, our Ventus Pro has uh, many different kinds of radios in it, uh, including Bluetooth and a 2.4 uh, radio. Um, and so, we're, yes, we're looking at ways that you can have both a smartphone device um, smart device uh, gateway as well as a uh, different gateway, a radio-based gateway to communicate. Uh, so typically most solutions are kind of oriented around one path, uh, but there are some that have started to either are looking forward to having redundant paths or multiple paths um, or already have them. For next question, what technologies are most reliable for getting data to the cloud? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, um, in terms of the instrument, from the instrument to the gateway side, uh, I don't know if I have an opinion on, on the reliability of that connection other than uh, some of the nuances that I talked about before in terms of Bluetooth. There's some range concerns, but if you're near the device you're communicating to, it's very reliable and high bandwidth. Um, Wi-Fi doesn't have a great rate range. Um, and um, and um, the uh, a radio inside of the instrument, you can get really good range. And if you've got a mesh network, you've got a lot of different paths uh, back to a gateway, or, or that can be that can be very reliable. Uh, from a gateway to the cloud side, um, you know, wired connections typically tend to work well. So Ethernet is probably one of the most reliable uh, ways of getting to the cloud. Uh, but if you're looking at wireless, um, I, I think that that cell uh, can be in many areas just as reliable as, as Wi-Fi, if not more so, uh, because you don't have other pieces to kind of go in between. Um, and then, of course, satellite, in theory, works everywhere, um, although you're, you're paying a lot for, uh, for data at that point. So I'm not giving you a definitive answer. I'm doing what some of our engineers do well, which is to say it depends. <laughs> Our next question, how can live monitoring reduce the need for checking in manually? Ah, yeah, so if, you're, um, if you have a live monitoring system and that live monitoring system can tell you when somebody has stopped communicating to it, uh, for example, you could, at the beginning of the day, a supervisor could look at the map and say, okay, my worker's on and they're working, I can see their information, and then, um, as, as long as that information is continuing um, to, to flow, there won't be an alert created. So at that point, you could manage by exception, and the worker could know that as long as I haven't gotten a text saying that my worker's either in trouble or has no longer been uh, has no longer um, um, is no longer being monitored, their instrument got lost, for example, or they got lost, um, then you wouldn't have to do a check-in. You could you could assume that that worker is 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 safe, and and working. 
Our next question, uh, we don't have mobile workers, but we do have isolated workers. Do you have a product for on-site monitoring of solo workers? Right. Yeah. So there, you can be a lone worker inside of a facility. Um, you can, you, you know, tank farms or something that I think of instantly when I think about that. Uh, in terms of, of the, you know, does the field have solutions for that? Yes. I think there's a lot of people who are thinking about that and looking into it. Uh, when you think about those, that, those plants, though, if you think about the most hazardous areas of locations, often they're the least accessible, right? And so it's hard to put infrastructure there and gateways there uh, in order to, to serve them. Um, so it, that's, it, that's again, I, I, we've talked to people who have workers and facilities that they've started to allow to carry smart devices uh, into certain parts of their, their plant um, because of the, you know, the risk of going there alone uh, is, is higher than the risk that a, that a smart device being present would create, particularly when there's a multi-gas uh, detector. But there, there are solutions for that, our ALSS solution is for, uh, with the Wi-Fi that we talked about earlier, that's for in-plant uh, applications or in-facility in applications as well. Um, but again, in, in large facilities, getting infrastructure everywhere can be quite a challenge. Our next question, do you need to be an INET subscriber to view live readings from the portable gas detection meters on mobile devices? Right. So. It's interesting. So INET, obviously, this is somebody that's familiar with our company, which is great. So um, INET is a platform, uh, if, and it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I think that they're talking about INET Exchange, right? So INET Exchange is a service that we offer uh, where we um, essentially lease uh, gas detectors to, to a company. And if something goes wrong with the gas detector, we... Uh, we know about it from, from our docking station and immediately send out a, a new, uh, completely ready piece of equipment in its place. Um, so you do not have to be an INET Exchange user or subscriber uh, in order to use INET now. In fact, you don't even have to have our docking stations and use INET control with our docking stations. You can just acquire INET now and, and use it with the instruments and have access to all the features you would have access to even if you were on INET Exchanger control. Our next question, how do you ensure communications and geolocation underground or inside buildings? Right. Um, that is a challenge. So we have a, um, you know, the, for, for INET now, our, the GPS location that we display on the map comes from the smart device. Um, and once you go, you know, usually you're not taking that smart device underground or into places where you don't get connectivity. So what do you, what do, you do when you go someplace where you can't see, you know, you can't get a GPS signal? Um, there, we have something called an iAssign beacon, which is a technology that uses Bluetooth. It's a, it's a beacon that just broadcasts uh, a site name, a location name. Uh, and whenever an instrument walks in proximity of that, that ISign beacon, it takes on that site name and then communicates the, that site name to the smart device and onto the cloud. So even though somebody is that not, you know, an, a worker might be underground, um, you could still know, you know, what, maybe what floor they're on or what part of a system they're at or what part of an underground facility they're at. Uh, using using ISign uh, beacons or other beaconing technology. Our next question: Do instruments require periodic calibration? Yes, in theory, all all gas detectors should require uh, periodic calibration um, in order to maintain the sensors. I think every every sensor technology that's used in portable gas detection has its particular failure modes and methods that requires uh, periodic maintenance. Outside of live monitoring personnel, are there any new techniques or methods that people should be aware of for gas monitoring as a whole? Wow, that's a broad question. Yeah. And, I'm <laughs> and I'm not sure how to, how to answer that without a little bit more context in terms of what areas they're trying to probe on. Uh, what type of certification do your sensors and platforms have to be compliant with? 
Uh, it, many. It depends on on the region uh, and and the countries that we're selling to. Uh, so there's many governing bodies uh, that that regulate not only sort of help us know that we're intrinsically safe, um, but even monitor performance of the gas detectors as well. So if you think about here in the United States, we have MSHA for for underground mines. Uh, CSA up in Canada does some performance testing. ATEX in Europe does some performance testing. So there's there's many, many around the world, there's many certifications that either measure that you're ready to go in terms of intrinsic safety or that you're performing at some kind of performance standard for your, your, your gas detector. Are, are, these devices, are these devices intrinsically safe? Yes, I, I, there's, there's, I'm not aware of any gas detectors that, especially those that do explosive gases um, uh, in our industry that aren't intrinsically safe. So the, the instruments themselves are going to be intrinsically safe. Uh, the gateways, not always. Um, as we talked about, there's not a lot of intrinsically safe smart devices uh, that, that work with, uh, with a lot of the Bluetooth that's out there for instruments. Uh, there are some intrinsically safe uh, gateways. Um, or, or at least things that can help transfer information from one place to another, uh, but those are more those are harder to come by and, and um, typically have fewer options in terms of communication. Thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded to our speaker. Once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Josh Futrell, everyone at Industrial Scientific, and all of our listeners. Thank you, and have a safe day. Thank you, everybody.